What's better, bariatric surgery or GLP-1 medicines? Hey, I'm Dr. Spencer Nadolsky, a triple board certified obesity specialist physician, and I wanna to talk today about bariatric surgery and GLP-1 medicines. All over the internet, you see bariatric surgeon influencers talking about some of the harms of GLP-1 medicines. Now, as I'll discuss in this video, it's not really fair to pit them against each other as it really turns out both of them are very good tools, but it really depends on the type of patient that comes in the door and which one you should recommend first. It's not really fair to compare them directly as it's a little bit apples to oranges, but we're gonna do it anyway. First things first, let's talk about how much people lose when you're doing bariatric surgery versus GLP-1 medicines. The two most common procedures in bariatric surgery are a gastric sleeve or a vertical sleeve gastrectomy or a ruin y gastric bypass, or as people call it, the gastric bypass. Now, percent of weight loss can vary depending on where you start, however, if you look at the bypass, we're looking at 30 to 35 and above percent total body weight loss. Now compare this to the most common GLP-1 medicines, which are semaglutide and terzepatide, which is technically a GLP-1 slash GIP coagonist. Semaglutide is going to get you around 15% of total body weight loss. Terzepatide, on the other hand, gets around 20 or so total body weight loss percent. So if right now we're looking at just total body weight loss in general, bariatric surgery wins, whether you get the sleeve or the bypass. In fact, there are other bariatric procedures that get you a higher percent total body weight loss too. Let's talk about other benefits. Take for example cardiovascular disease event reduction. Now there is no fair comparison because bariatric surgery has not been compared to a placebo over many years to show some sort of event reduction. Now if you're looking at the SELECT trial that I've talked about many times before with semaglutide and those with a history of cardiovascular disease and obesity but not type 2 diabetes, we're seeing around a 20% reduction over three years or so. Now with bariatric surgery there has not been a randomized controlled trial. This means they have not compared the bariatric surgery compared to a placebo. So again, we're comparing apples to oranges here. However, they have some pretty strong observational data where they take people who have had the bariatric surgery compared to those who have not, not in a randomized trial, but in what's called a matched cohort observational study and show it looks like a pretty significant decrease risk of cardiovascular events and even mortality over time compared to those who did not get the surgery. So while we don't have gold standard data to show that bariatric surgery definitely reduces risks of cardiovascular events, I think it's safe to say, and I would bet a lot of money that they do. Now, what about diabetes prevention and treatment? Obviously, the GLP-1 medicines are literally indicated for type 2 diabetes and have a very strong reduction in blood sugar and complications from type 2 diabetes. The same can be said with bariatric surgery. We see a very robust lowering of blood sugars and decreases in diabetes complications. So I think it's safe to say that both therapies have strong improvements in various cardiometabolic disease processes. What about cost? Well, the GLP-1 medicines are somewhere around $500 a month if we're talking about going directly through Eli Lilly with Lilly Direct. We're talking about $6,000 per year while you're taking the medicine if you're paying out of pocket. These costs can increase if we're talking about the middlemen of the PBMs and insurances and the rebates and all that stuff going from the manufacturer PBM and insurance to you at the pharmacy, but we'll stick with the out-of-pocket costs for now. With bariatric surgery, we're talking about a one and done twenty dollars to $30,000 and insurance usually covers it if you qualify. If you're paying out of pocket, sometimes you can get it down to somewhere around fifteen or so thousand dollars. Again, that's one and done as opposed to $6,000 or so a year. So if we're just looking at total body weight loss, cardiometabolic outcomes, and we're talking about costs, within three years, you would have paid for all that stuff just doing the bariatric surgery versus doing the GLP-1 medicine alone. So with this in mind, the bariatric surgery seems to be a lot better of a choice compared to the GLP-1 medicine. However, as most of my patients will say when I bring up bariatric surgery, they don't want to get cut because they're worried about complications. Now, luckily, we have what are called centers of excellence. I have multiple bariatric surgery friends who work at these centers of excellence and their complication rates are relatively low. The mortality rate for bariatric surgery at a center of excellence is somewhere around one, maybe two per 1,000 surgeries. That's not small if you think about it. So every 1,000 people who walks in could die from the surgery. Major complications rates range from around 2% up to 5%. We're talking things like wound infections, having to go back in there and redo some of the surgery, pulmonary emboli, and DVTs, clots in your legs. So we're looking at somewhere around two to five people who get the surgery, whether it's a sleeve or a room wide gastric bypass. The, the rates are a little bit different between the two, but similar will have some sort of major complication. Some of the long-term complications are obviously nutritional deficiencies that are usually overcome with a special bariatric multivitamin and mineral 
animal supplement. Now, compare that to the risk of GLP-1 medicines, mostly we're seeing a lot of nausea and gastrointestinal side effects. These GI side effects are generally mild to moderate and go away over time and reversible if you stop the medicine. We do once in a while see more severe side effects from the GLP-1 medicines, things like severe vomiting that require hospitalization that can occur but can be minimized with the proper precautions. There are some other severe side effects that are occurring in case reports right now, but there's no strong signal of any one thing that we should be really worried about. The other thing to note is that bariatric surgery is not reversible unless you get a lap band. The sleeve or the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass are permanent changes. Whereas the GLP-1 medicines, you can just literally stop the medicine and in general, the side effects go away. Now, as I mentioned before, it's actually a false dichotomy to really compare these and pit one versus the other, even though I'm doing it in this video. The patient that walks through your door may be a better candidate for bariatric surgery versus going to the GLP-1 medicines and vice versa. Bariatric surgery is in general reserved for those with a body mass index or a BMI of 40 and above. It can get down to around 35 and sometimes a little bit lower if you have things like type 2 diabetes and other types of weight related comorbidities. Compare that to the GLP-1 medicines where we see these things used or at a much smaller and lower BMI with fewer comorbidities. In the past, the BMI requirements were around 27 BMI with what's called a comorbidity or a 30 BMI with no comorbidities for these medicines. That has lowered some a bit since the FDA has removed that BMI requirement from the label. And now we are clinically diagnosing obesity in these patients and utilizing these medicines when we think it's indicated. So already you see a complete contrast between those who are qualified for bariatric surgery versus those with the GLP-1 medicine. So again, it's not fair to compare them, but we're doing it anyway. It's also a false dichotomy because you could get bariatric surgery and then go on the medicine or even go on the medicine, then get bariatric surgery, stop the medicine, then restart the medicine later. This is what the best obesity physicians do. They will use every tool in their box for the appropriate patient. So for example, if a patient who is, let's say, 45-year-old woman has a 35 BMI but is stark healthy, she wants to lose some weight, has been trying for a long time, and wants to start ZepBound. Would I take that patient and say, no, I really recommend bariatric surgery? No, I would start thinking about ZepBound. Let's contrast that to a patient who is, let's say, 45 again with a 50 BMI with severe sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes, severe osteoarthritis of their knees. Now in this patient, the right recommendation, you could start with the GLP-1 medicine, such as ZepBound. Obviously, it would be approved with type 2 diabetes and the severe sleep apnea, but it may be more appropriate to be more aggressive and go towards the bariatric surgery. There's no harm in actually trying out the GLP-1 medicine in that patient, but it wouldn't be wrong to choose bariatric surgery before the ZepBound or Manjaro, considering they have type 2 diabetes. It also wouldn't be wrong to start with that and then get the surgery later if they didn't respond as well. Let's say that patient with the 50 BMI lost a lot of weight and got down to a 40 BMI but still had sleep apnea and osteoarthritis of their knees. That patient would still be a good candidate to get bariatric surgery while taking the medicine. You could stop the medicine, get the surgery, see if they lose more weight, and potentially add the medicine later. The most important thing is going over the risks and benefits of both therapies. It's wrong to say one is better than the other. It's more appropriate to look at that patient in front of you and decide what's going to be best for them and have a shared decision-making process. Process. I have patients that I strongly think would be better suited for bariatric surgery and they're like, no, 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 my family member had it, they had multiple complications, I want to stay away from that, please don't bring it up again. I make sure I note it in the note not to bring it up again. However, it's our duty as obesity specialists to make sure we're giving the best options to each patient and not be pigeonholed into either medicine or the surgery. We should always consider both. And it really, again, depends on the patient. I will say that actually the combination is really cool to watch with my patients. I have a lot of patients who did the sleeve or ruin y gas bypass and they felt really great after they had it they lost a lot of weight but they started regaining their weight a lot of that food noise was still really strong despite the bariatric surgery and then i come in and just add a little bit of let's say terzepatide and that food noise goes away and they're able to continue on their weight loss journey and keep all those comorbidities that they had before at bay the quality of life is so much better with both of them that i see anecdotally of course again a lot of patients may do well with just one versus the other but i think it's always worth looking into use both if indicated. So there you have it, folks. GLP-1 medicines versus bariatric surgery. Which one's better? Of course, there's not a great answer to that. As if you are a good obesity doctor, you should be thinking about utilizing one or the other or even both in certain situations. Hope this video is helpful. Make sure you share it with a friend or family member who is thinking about a GLP-1 medicine or surgery. And if you're interested in weight loss and obesity and GLP-1 medicines, make sure you subscribe to my channel.